My name is Kadri Tashtan. I'm a senior fellow with the normal resident. Sorry, normal resident senior fellow now with the German Marshall Fund in Brussels. And uh, this discussion is uh, co organized actually by GMF and Chatham House together. Uh, Chatham House Turkey Initiative, Russia and Euro Asia program, and GMF, TOBB, and uh, Turkey program in Brussels. Actually, in, in Brussels, we we launched a Turkey program in 2017 uh, in cooperation with the uh, Union of Chambers and Community Exchange of Turkey. And we are organizing discussion on Turkey, mainly in Brussels, but also in other European capitals and sometimes in DC as well. And we are very grateful for this cooperation. And also, uh, particularly, my Chatham House uh, colleagues, uh, Lubika, Gali. Natalie uh, Melania. So uh, I will not be long. I know this is really useless part, the welcoming generally, <laughs> really short. Uh, Russia's war in Ukraine uh, is uh, entering its third year, and its consequences are being felt, of course, around the world, especially in Europe, particularly in the uh, Black Sea region. And the uh, second secret architecture uh, of Europe is challenged. And the Black Sea kind of became a, a Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, security uh, center the issue again. And uh, obviously, this, uh, this war is having far-reaching effect on, uh, on the Black Sea region. Of course, uh, I have to specify the Ukrainians are paying a huge price and in terms of their lives, infrastructures, environment, livelihood. But uh, it's also felt uh, in the, all countries in the in the region, and we are also in a, a challenging global uh, times. The world is ever fragmented and uh, and divided. So, uh, and the Black Sea region is becoming a kind of important issues and uh, a, a competition uh, subject of, for different powers in the region and global. Um, so, there are a lot to discuss. We have a really great uh, panel. I would like to also thank them. To, to accept accepting to talk in this uh, panel and enjoy the discussion and thank you very much again for this conversation. Oh, thank you, Kadri. Um, so hello again and welcome everyone uh, here at Chatham House and online uh, to this event. We're asking who is winning in the Black Sea. As Kadri mentioned, it's a team effort between GMF Turkey, Turkey Initiative, and Russia and Russia program here at Chatham House. For those of you who don't know me, I'm with Polakova and I'm with the Russia and Eurasia team here at Chatham House. Um, so in this session, we'll be looking at what impact the war has had on the Black Sea region so far and how things may play out going forward. And of course, the Black Sea region was very much in the news in the first months of the war um, due to the Russian <coughs> blockade of Ukrainian grain exports. Uh, and in more recent months, the, uh, the, the focus has been mostly on the land front, but actually Ukraine has achieved some remarkable successes. Um, on the naval front, including securing a grain export route and eroding Russia's naval supremacy in the Black Sea. Uh, we also have, have had interesting news coming out of Transnistria in the past few days, so that we can also touch on that. Um, and to, um, so, uh, to do this, we have an excellent panel in alphabet order, Galib Dalai, who's a senior consulting fellow with the Turkey Initiative, uh, at Middle, with the Middle East and North Africa program here at Chatham House. Ivan Krasjev is the chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and permanent fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna. Ambassador Natalie Savanadze, senior fellow with the Russia and Eurasia program here at Chatham House. And Marina Vorotnyuk, an associate fellow with our friends at Rusi. So our panelists will offer uh, brief initial remarks around 10 minutes each. Then we'll mo move to the Q&A. Uh, if you are joining us online, please use the Q&A function. Uh, and if you're here in the room, then please raise your hand. And I'll do I'll do my best to catch as many questions as possible. Before we start, um, just a reminder that this, this discussion is on the record and being recorded. Uh, you're very welcome to share the content from the from the event on um, the social media platform of your choice. Right. So with that, let's kick it off. Um, Marina, could you could you start and maybe tell us more about the <coughs> military and security developments yes. so far? What Ukraine has achieved? Um, 
how the world has changed dynamics in the Black Sea. Thank you very much, Lubisa. Thank you for having me for this Black Sea conversation. And the apologies for my voice, it's failing me today. But uh, it's been reassuring to see a heightened interest to the Black Sea uh, and uh, the realization that it was uh, undeservedly neglected for years. So uh, it's, as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a very significant development to see the realization that we need to compensate for that neglect and to some uh, concrete actions taken to compensate. So Black Sea has been an important theater of Russian Ukraine war. And of course, understandably, the main focus is on the land operation, what's happening there, the situation on the ground. And I think we've seen already some sort of uh, gloomy outlook setting in, in terms of uh, looking at uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive not delivering the desired stated objectives. Uh, you, there has been a, a ter Russia's territorial gain uh, on Avdivka, the last uh, in several, I mean, first in several months. So Russia has clearly gained and maintains the initiative. And uh, in the Black Sea, meanwhile, in comparison, it's Ukraine who maintains, has gained and maintains the initiative. And I think this is a stark contrast. That's why it's important to have a conversation like this. So Ukraine has achieved and, and seems to maintain the advantage in the Black Sea at the moment. And, and Russia was compelled into a defensive posture. So the Black Sea, we know, has been a site of conflict between Russia and Ukraine since at least 2014. So we remember occupation and the start of militarization of Crimea, then the creeping occupation of Russia in the Sea of Azov, then the strategy of denial in the Black Sea. Russia was closing the Black Sea for the exercises. It was harassing and uh, seizing Ukraine with small warships on one occasion. So, and in 2022, Black Sea turns into an actual battlefield. So Ukraine has two major objectives as of currently in this domain, in this theater. The first objective is to continue to prevent Russia's attack from the sea. And the second objective is to reassert the freedom of navigation in the Black Sea, is to uh, res uh, resume the work of the Black Sea fleets, uh, Black Sea ports, sorry and to restore the sea experts, which its economy is very heavily dependent on. So let me structure my thoughts around those two objectives, because we see definitely the success on both tracks. So the first track, uh, prevent, continue preventing Russia's attack. We've seen uh, that uh, Ukraine has managed uh, to significantly degrade Russian capabilities in the Black Sea. It carried out the asymmetric and very harming strikes against Russian land and sea targets using the anti-ship missiles, cruise, cruise missiles, uh, drones, uh, uh, and it targets the Russian military installations in Crimea, radars, air defense, command and control. So reportedly, uh, Russia lost one third of its Black Sea fleet to Ukraine. And uh, so Ukrainian armed forces deoccupied Snake Island, strategic, small, the strategic outpost, earlier and the gas rigs that fell under Russian control uh, in the start of the reinvasion. So this is also important. So if we imagine the Black Sea, this domain, so Ukrainians managed to, to let's say, to make Russia retreat from the northwestern part of the Black Sea. This is very significant. So now they had to retreat closer to their own shore in the east of the Black Sea, so uh, next to Novorossiysk. And so their ability to operate freely in the Black Sea has been significantly curtailed and, and limited. And of course, the initial goal of Russian operation, we know, has been to carry out the amphibious landing to Odessa. It's not any longer looking very probable. So this has been, again, a very significant achievement. Ukraine managed to create the A2AD bubble around the Odessa and this part of the, of the Black Sea. So this is, uh, again, and Ukraine carries out attacks against Crimea that I mentioned with the objective to uh, diminish uh, Russia's position in the region, in, in, in Crimea, and diminish Russia's ability to use Crimea as a springboard for attacks against Ukraine. So when I'm asked whether this is a game changer, how significant this all is, so this is, of course, is laying grounds for, for future liberation of Crimea. So of course, 
the situation, the overall uh, outcome of the war will be decided in ground operation. But what Ukraine is doing in the sea domain, it complements those objectives. So it complements what its objectives it has or on the land operation. So, and as I said, this results quite striking, knowing the disparity the, the, between the two parties. So Ukraine doesn't have naval assets of its own since 2014, when the seizure of Crimea. So it uh, didn't manage to develop any robust uh, fleet since that time. So Russia had the advantage in the Black Sea, according to some estimates, I've seen 12-fold advantage uh, as when the rain invasion started. So it had full control over Crimea and it gained full control over the Sea of Azov in the early days of the, um, when the, uh, the rain invasion. So the fact that Ukraine managed to actually address those bottlenecks military and economic that Russia has created is quite striking. And that I'm going now to the next point, which is a restoration of the, of the commercial navigation. It's the second significant objective, which we see significant progress here. So we know when the rain invasion started, uh, Russia carried out the de facto full maritime blockade of the Black Sea ports that Ukraine has. So basically, these are the greater Odessa ports, so called, uh, and Pivdanich, uh, Morsk, uh, and Odessa, three, three ones which Ukraine uses for, the, for its export at the moment. So, and then uh, the Black Sea Great Initiative was operating for one year. It was a significant relief. It was mediated by UN and Turkey. So much praise goes to Turkey, of course, for, the, for those efforts. There were significant limitations in how it was working. But again, as I said, it was a lifeline at that time. So Russia withdrew from that, from that deal, we know. And what happened next? U Ukraine managed to, carry, to implement a unilateral initiative, which we see working. So the humanitarian uh, corridor, uh, which goes through those Odessa ports to uh, through territorial waters of Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey. That means that this is this seems to be compelling enough for Russia not to attack those uh, vessels going through those waters. Uh, and uh, as of I mean the recent uh, data I've seen from early February since summer next several months more than six hundred sixty ships. Uh, used as this route to carry out the commodities from the ports. More than 20 million tons were uh, carried out. So this is, and majority of them grains, but not only grain. This is again in contrast to the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which was only about grain. Here, Ukraine can transport and export other commodities that are very crucial for its economy. So, of course, Russia continues to target those uh, facilities, grain and port facilities. When I was in Odessa in January, the attacks were daily with lots of fatalities and casualties. And uh, so, as I said, uh, there, are, there are much successes. And now let me go to the unclarity. My last point for my 10 minutes <coughs> is unclarity for the Black Sea. Again, the outcome of the Russia-Ukraine war, but also the unclarity connected with the uh, general uh, outlook for the Western engagement in the Black Sea. So we know Turkey applied Montreux Convention, which I think there is a consensus was a significant contribution to Ukraine's war effort. This helped Ukraine, this prevented Russia from reinforcing its positions, from redeploying fleet uh, or vessels from other fleets to the Black Sea. So that helped a lot. That created equilibrium to Ukraine's advantage. So this is an important, I think, starting position. On the other hand, let us look into the future with the war becoming protracted and with Turkey clearly saying that uh, the application will last till the war is over. So what does this tell us about the Western engagement, naval engagement in the region? The last uh, warship from a uh, NATO warship of non littoral state left uh, the Black Sea in December 21, in clear, clearly anti, uh, in anticipation of Russian uh, aggression. So there are no, once Black Sea was a hub for very active international naval, naval exercises and activities. In summer 21, we've had the largest in their history, US, Ukraine, sea breeze exercises, multinational exercises. 
the rock. So we don't have anything of the sort now, no uh, port visits, no exercises. So what does this all tell us uh, about the future? Uh, lots of unclarity about the stand, naval standing of uh, allied nations like Romania and Bulgaria, for instance, for whom this all is clearly in future might become problematic, uh, and for Turkey as well, I, I would even argue. For Ukraine, uh, there is a commitment to help it replenish its naval assets, but we've seen Turkey not allowing the UK minesweepers past the straits. The UK might be donated the minesweepers for Ukraine, and this would be a huge contribution for demining the area around the Odessa ports if those uh, minesweepers were delivered, but they were not because this uh, limitation applies to both belligerent nations, to Russia and Ukraine, by, 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 by Turkey. So, and as I said, there is a Turkish position and there is Western position, which at the moment is clearly in line with Turkish position. It's clear and conscious disengagement from naval presence in the Black Sea in a fear of escalation with Russia, something which again is probably, I don't have time for this now, we need to discuss. And so uh, my last sentence is that there are there is lots of unclarity and there are, I would argue, risks associated with this conscious disengagement and with the fact that it's, it, at some point it might be very difficult to reverse this naval disengagement because we don't know under, when it happens and how and under which conditions it happens. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Natalie, over to you. Uh, you promised to address the threats posed by Russia to EU and NATO ambitions in the region and uh, some possible implications for Georgia as well. Please tell us more about that. Uh, thank you, Lukasa. Um, great to be here. Um, I will start by a couple general observations and then go uh, a little bit more into specifics. Um, two general observations. One, of course, is that Russia has been pursuing a revisionist strategy for the past two decades, at least, in the region with the aim of establishing uncontested hegemony and challenging the post-Cold War European security. Um, the West hasn't really pushed back uh, on this uh, in the Black Sea. Um, and as a result, the kind of threats that we see today, and I will talk a little bit in greater detail uh, about this, they emerged as a result of interreaction or a relationship between Russia's revisionism uh, weakness of the states of the region, and by weakness, I mean democratic lack of democratic resilience, economic development, military capabilities. They are different, but overall, um, we can say that they're relatively weak, and uh, the failure of Western deterrence. Um, the second point is that uh, the Russian hegemony is associated with instability. Um, we can describe it as negative for Germany, despite all the talk, and Russians do like to repeat it, that they are interested in the stability in the neighborhood. Uh, the evidence shows uh, the opposite. Uh, the evidence indicates that, in fact, Russia has been very successful in sort of creating and then managing this instability to its uh, geopolitical uh, advantage. Uh, Black Sea region is an area of numerous conflicts. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, almost in all of them, Russia had uh, its hand um, and it was interested in keeping them simmering. So it is a power, now we know, uh, um, but in the region, this was known already before. It is a power that has a vested interest in disorder. Um, so as a result, we have uh, various uh, complicating factors, threats, risks uh, that I would like to um, outline. First is uh, the fragmented region. I mean, this is the region that sometimes your colleagues, I think, Marina, like to describe as variable geometry. So you have three 
um, NATO member states, you have uh, two EU member states, you have three EU and NATO aspirants, you have Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. So that has created a very fragmented landscape, which in a way also complicates having a kind of coherent joined up approach to uh, the region from the West. And there is also a variable geometry when it comes to ambitions and capabilities of the main states uh, of the region. Uh, second threat is Russia's power uh, assertion. Russia, uh, well, it's Black Sea has often been described as the Russian lake. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but Russia definitely sees it as such and believes that so it should be. Um, Black Sea is very important for Russia. It is very uh, for its self-perception as the great power. Um, it is very proud of the Black Sea uh, fleet um, and uh, it finds it extremely important for uh, its power projection, obviously, beyond the region, particularly <coughs> in the Mediterranean, um, Middle East, uh, the Balkans. So it is a big problem because Russia has a sense of entitlement over this sea. Um, and Crimea is a big part of this entitlement. And uh, if one recalls uh, Putin's uh, various pronouncements about Crimea, it is part of the Russian identity, it is part of Russian heritage, and this is where Russia's new renaissance has to begin. These attitudes towards Crimea and the Black Sea goes beyond Putin. Uh, even uh, Mr. Navalny, who uh, is considered uh, and was um, a liberal activist, he also thought that Crimea uh, belonged to Russia, and he even referred to it, well, Crimea is not a sandwich that we need to pass from one hand to another, and let's have a referendum which will be free and decide that it is actually Russia. So this is something that is very much uh, ingrained. Um, Russia has been working to shift its power balance within uh, the Black Sea since 2008 with the uh, war in Georgia. As a result, it is occupying two thirds of the Georgian coast, which is um, the region of um, Abkhazia, then 2014 Crimea. Uh, and uh, the response to these advances from the institutions from the institutional West that you refer have been very uh, muted. Uh, in the first case, in case of Georgia, there was no response. In the second uh, instance, uh, a, a weak response. So why is the question? Um, and I believe the answer is because uh, for the West, um, Black Sea has been traditionally very peripheral to the European security. Uh, as a result, the threat perceptions varied, uh, and it very easily became sort of hostage of domestic political bargaining. Uh, Germany was uh, convinced uh, that the best way to approach Russian threats is through engagement and integration of Russia economically, institutionally. US was busy pivoting to Asia. Um, there was this debate which one is a bigger threat. Uh, Russia or China, the perception of the Russian threat was consistently underestimated apart from the uh, few countries uh, in the alliance and in the EU. So we can say that until February 2022, benign neglect was pretty much the policy or the approach of the West towards um, uh, Black Sea. Uh, Russia's plans uh, by now is very clear. As Marina referred, it wants to finish the job it started in 2008, basically cut off Ukraine off the Black Sea coast, take Odessa, uh, and establish full control. Uh, this would obviously cripple uh, Ukraine economically, strategically. Uh, Russia would establish full control over trade uh, maritime routes as well as energy routes. Uh, and. Uh, the balance in the Black Sea Basin will be completely tilted in Russia's uh, favor. Um, uh, what can happen from this, of course, is um, we have seen the, uh, the blockade uh, of the earlier blockade of the uh, Ukrainian uh, ports that uh, sent uh, uh, grain markets basically in disarray. Uh, the supply chains were disrupted food shortages, and we know very well that uh, there is a real correlation, direct correlation between food prices and stability 
political and economic stability in much of the global south. And it is um, uh, an interest and objective, declared objective of both the NATO and the EU to uh, strengthen stability um, in uh, the neighboring regions, uh, particularly in the MENA region. Um, energy is also important, and uh, as uh, the war continues, uh, obviously Europe is trying and has uh, successfully in many ways tried to wean off the Russian energy. This makes uh, alternative sources and routes particularly important, and uh, Black Sea is uh, one of them. There is this project of underwater cable as well that has been uh, agreed by the EU, Georgia, Azerbaijan, um, that would supply electricity um, to Europe via uh, Georgia. And there is plan to build um, a deep sea port in Anaklia, which would be an important uh, element in the project of Middle Corridor. That's a Georgian coast. All these uh, projects would be um, uh, under threat. But of course, um, this would be a huge uh, and a direct threat to the rules-based international order, which both the EU and NATO are um, uh, committed to uh, promote. Um, moving, uh, moving on to uh, the, the states that will be affected, of course, Ukraine would be particularly um, uh, affected. Uh, and we can imagine that any future containment of Russia in the region uh, would depend on success of Ukraine. Ukraine will be a central pillar of, uh, of any containment policy. Uh, it would be extremely important power to balance Russia's uh, influence in the Black Sea. Uh, so uh, it is, as, uh, if we think so, Russians also see it as a threat and would like to do everything to um, stop this from happening. If Odessa falls, of course, um, Russia finds its way very easily to Transnistria which it already controls anyway. Uh, this would destabilize uh, Moldova. There's been uh, repeated attempts to uh, undermine uh, the current government in Moldova. I think this would become extremely easy. And with the destabilization of Moldova, this comes very close to uh, Romania, which would also um, become uh, vulnerable. Uh, Romania has been very supportive of Ukraine. Ukrainian-Romanian relations have not been uh, very smooth before, but in this case, Romania has put aside some of its earlier grievances um, and has been very committed to uh, supporting um, Ukraine. Russia sees with a lot of distrust and um, considers it as a potential threat, the cooperation between Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, and the mind-sweeping cooperation uh, is one of them. I will very quickly mention Georgia. As Marina said, uh, the main obstacle <laughs> in Russia to realize its plan is, of course, Ukraine's extremely successful um, uh, asymmetric campaign against uh, uh, Russian Navy. Uh, so as under the pressure, Russia is looking for safer harbors. And one place where it is thinking of building um, uh, a naval base in the occupied Abkhazia or Chamchire, which potentially can uh, drag uh, Georgian territory into the war, particularly if it uses this base to attack um, Ukraine. Uh, this makes Georgia particularly uh, vulnerable. Uh, and in general, Georgia is vulnerable also to increasing Russian hybrid uh, threats uh, and increasing political penetration as well. There are elections coming up. There are about, uh, we can see mushrooming of pro-Russian uh, political parties um, and, and the sort of traditional, very pro-Western um, ally in the region is drifting in a, in a different camp. Uh, Turkey's factor is, of course, very important, but I will leave it to Galip, who I'm sure will take it on. Oh, thank you. Now, Ivan, over to you. First of all, I'm very sorry you couldn't join us in person here at Chatham House, but thank you for braving the virus and joining us online. Uh, could you tell us more about what do European policymakers make of, make of the situation and how is the you know, EU and US nexus in relation to the war evolving? Thank you very much. And first, I really want to excuse myself, but I have one of these bad colds. So when you see my voice, there is nothing dramatic to say. Simply, this is cold. Uh, and secondly, 
to be uh, uh, very fair, Black Sea region never was uh, kind of at the core of my expertise, but I was very much interested in this discussion for five reasons. The first is President Putin cannot be trusted much when he talks about the past, but he's quite reliable when he's saying what he wants to do. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're listening to him carefully, and this was true even in the Tucker Carlson's interview, he has a map in his head, and in this map, Odessa is a Russian city. So from this point of view, if there is a clear strategic territorial objectives, it's very much about Odessa. <clears throat> And if uh, Dzerzhinsky used to say that uh, Russia without Ukraine is not empire, the truth is that Ukraine without an access to the Black Sea ports is never going to be a real sovereign state. And from this point of view, it goes really deep. And I do believe that the only reason uh, basically this cannot happen is that at the moment, the Ukrainians are very successfully basically resisting on this, uh, uh, on this front. Uh, but also, you should keep in mind that this is not simply in the Putin's map. Uh, there was a lot of public opinion polling had been done in Russia after 2014. And some gap was critically important, like Crimea, that basically triggered an incredible enthusiasm all over the Russian society. Donbass didn't move the Russian public much. This is true. It moves to a certain type of ambition of Kremlin itself, but it doesn't resonate with the people. There is only one symbolic city where if Russians are going to take, Putin can talk about victory. And this is Odessa. So from this point of view, what is happening on the Black Sea and what is happening on Odessa is important from the symbolic domestic political point of view, from strategic point of view. And this is why Black Sea is critically important. Plus, uh, the pressure is not simply that it's basically depriving Ukraine of a certain type of an incomes and money that are coming out of the export of grain and not only grain. But this is also putting a lot of tensions and pressure of the relations between Ukraine and some of its neighbors, because it's enough to look on the blockade on the land borders in order to understand that basically blocking Odessa is also the way to try to create much more tensions uh, between Ukraine and some of their allies. So from this point of view, in my view, this is critically important. And this is why the Black Sea is probably much more important than people realize, and I very much agree with the previous speakers. Also, this is the area in which Ukraine really achieved a lot uh, for the last six months, contrary to the expectations of many and contrary to totally asymmetry that you see. The, but the third important part of the Black Sea is Russia-Turkish relations, and I'm sure that Galip is going to say much more about this. Uh, but uh, for Russia, Turkey is the most important strategic player on the European periphery. And of course, these relations are very departmentalized. It's a very complex, it's a very much changing. But put it simply, uh, Russia cannot afford to lose Turkey. And as a result of it, Russia basically should do things, should be careful also not to do other things, because Black Sea and Turkey is also the place that connects the two type of zones of military conflicts that we see at the moment, mm -hmm. Middle East and Ukraine. And for Russia, it's critically important basically also to use some of this link, to use certain leverage that it has. Uh, and uh, this is why the relations with Turkey, in my view, have a central importance for any positioning of Russia. The fourth thing that makes it important is certain political dynamics in the neighboring countries. And uh, as the previous speaker said, both Bulgaria and Romania have been very supportive for Ukraine. But listen, always make a distinction between the government and where the public opinion stands. And from this point of view, both in Bulgaria and Romania, I have been seeing quite a lot of polling over these two years. You have a lot of vulnerability. It's not that you have a pro-Russian sentiment, but this is a country that want to stay out. Uh, listen, the, the countries in the Black Sea region does not stay where the Baltic Republic states or where Poland states. Uh, you're going to be surprised to see that when it comes uh, when the war should end, how it should end. Romanian public opinion is closer to Italy, and Bulgaria and Greece are not basically the most kind of enthusiastic supporters, regardless of what their governments are doing. So as a result of it, and this is my major point for this presentation, there is a lot of talk now, and in my view, legitimate talk, uh, that there is a certain window of vulnerability in which uh, basically President Putin can try 
to test Article 5 with respect to some of the NATO member states. If you are basically sitting in Kremlin, are you going to do it with Estonia and basically the Baltic and Scandinavian rounds? Or is it not much easier to do it in the Black Sea where basically this is not a kind of a land conflict that way you can expect that some of the countries uh, themselves are going to ask for a muted response and not for an active response? And this is why, and I'm going to end up on this, if we really believe that there could be a major provocation on the Russian side that goes beyond Ukraine itself, from strategic point of view, the most vulnerable place is Black Sea, and it's not the Baltics. I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Jan. Um, and finally, um, we're, we're, you're, the, you're our last panelist for the initial remarks. So can you tell us more about the, 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 the politics of the security mm -hmm. situation and how Turkey has been managing yeah. it? I think at the political level, when I look at the region, what has changed or what has changed, what was also in the process of changing, but has been actually further strengthened since the war, the three uh, dimensions or the three things seems to be crucial. One of them is we were also chatting yesterday over dinner as well. Previously, at the Black Sea uh, region level, particularly countries like you know Turkey and Russia, that was very much focused on the idea of the regional ownership, uh, a form of regional order through regional ownership. Uh, and that was also premised on the idea of the regional solution for the regional problems. I think that is fundamentally shattered. So a regional order uh, through the regional uh, ownership, the idea of the regional order through the regional uh, ownership, is fundamentally shattered, and for a long time we have to be, we have to accept the fact that this is going to be a fragmented region. So whatever order or disorder we are talking about, it's going to be an order and disorder taking place within the framework of an highly fragmented uh, region, if not a shattered uh, region. The secondly, <clears throat> I think it's uh, I see a stark contrast between the political psychology that is prevailing in the West about the uh, about the uh, Russian uh, about the Russian invasion and also what I observe from the policy level approach of the countries in South Caucasus or uh, or in Central Asia. Uh, the countries that Russia tr uh, traditionally regard being in its traditional zone of influence. In the West, more and more the mood is becoming bleak uh, that actually, you know, Russia might win without defining what this win means, but the, the initial optimism or at least the previous optimism that actually Russia might lose is more um, is fading away. There's a new sense that Russia actually can win at this potentially. Again, like you know, defining this win without defining this win. But when I look at the policy responses of many countries in the post-Soviet space, that tells me something else. I mean, the Kazakhstan and Armenia is quite important in this regard. The Armenia is phrasing its membership in CSTO. The Kazakhstan trying to kind of you know uh, charting a new uh, uh, foreign policy orientation. That is quite indicative of the mood, at least prevalent in some countries in the in uh, in uh, Central Asia and South Caucasus. The the third element that I see is with the geopolitical identity, and there also we see two contrasting trends. On the one hand, the zone of Russian occupation zones in the region is increasing. Uh, we see this 2008 with Georgia, 2014 with Crimea, now with this invasion, etc. So the Russian occupation zones in the region is increasing. But on the other hand, we see this region more and more being integrated, gradually integrated into the Western ecosystem in one way or another. The interlinkages with you, uh, the economic interlinkages with Europe is increasing with uh, many regional littoral states uh, of the Black Sea. The uh, NATO's uh, capabilities in the region is increasing through the NATO member states, but most important through the Bulgaria and, and Romania. So we see the two contrasting trends happening and unfolding at the same time. Uh, so the Russian occupation is deepening and enlarging in the region, but also the regional, uh, the region gradually being integrated more into the Western 
uh, ecosystem, be it through the economic linkages or the security linkages uh, that we are uh, seeing. And I think this is uh, quite uh, interesting for the future of the region when we discuss it. So here the Turkey, how does the Turkey feature? From outside, the Turkish policy might come across a bit, you know, uh, puzzling because uh, I used to say at the early stage of the invasion, I defined the Turkish policy being pro-Ukraine without becoming anti-Russia. And I think that's quite a tricky situation to be. But this is pretty much, I see the policy still being, like being pro-Ukraine without becoming anti-Russia. Anti, uh, anti and I think that's to some extent, Turkey definitely doesn't want Russia to win because the Russia winning in the Black Sea means long-term strategic threat for Turkey. Uh, we were discussing the other day, we had uh, a, a workshop on, uh, on uh, uh, East Med and Middle East, uh, we mentioned there as well, the Russia and uh, Turkey, or being the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, had 13 wars, and most of these wars centered on the Black Sea. And this is more than, you know, the, Tur uh, the Turkish wars with the different Western, uh, Western powers combined. And you can add to this list also the three proxy wars in indirect wars that we are seeing taking place in Syria, Libya, and Nagorno-Karabakh. So, therefore, a Russian win with dramatically reduced Turkish rule of maneuver. But at the same time, the Turkey didn't want Russia to lose as well, because a Russian defeat, again, like, you know, it's difficult to uh, to uh, to also define what a defeat, what a defeat for a nuclear power uh, country means. But a Russia, Russian defeat, Turkey would have seen as another unchecked Western uh, resurgence in international system. And given the level of discontent between Turkey and the West, particularly in the Middle East and Mediterranean, and this is not also a desirable situation from Turkish point of view. And in a sense right now, actually what is happening is not the worst case scenario for Turkey, if not to some extent its preferable option, it's a reduced Russia. Russia not winning, Russia not losing, but a reduced Russia uh, that we are seeing uh, probably likely to emerge uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, the Russia, reduced Russia in the sense, the Russian reduction of Russian uh, naval capability in the region, that the reduction of Russian also, you know, uh, other capabilities in the, in the region. And that's actually is uh, quite not a bad news, let me put it that way, from the Turkish, uh, uh, the Turkish strategic <laughs> point of view. The other elements, for a long time, Turkey saw Russia as a challenge. But I think with this revisionism, with this invasion, Turkey now sees Russia more through the lens of a threat. And challenge and threat should induce two different types of the, uh, responses. For a long time, for Turkey, Russia was a challenge that can be managed. Difficult and knowing what can be managed. I think right now, Russia is turning into a threat. Do a reduced Russia is reduced, but it's a revisionist at the same time. So a reduced and revisionist Russia is what we have to grapple uh, and grapple with. And I think that inevitably will induce more and more the dynamics of counterbalancing against Russia uh, in the Black Sea or elsewhere. The counterbalancing at this stage would not uh, facilitate NATO's entry into the Black Sea. I think despite this, the Turkey will be quite resistant to the idea of NATO's presence uh, in the Black Sea. The idea of like, you know, keeping the external powers outside of the region will be still a very defining feature of the Turkish policy uh, towards the region. But nevertheless, a more coordination between the NATO member states in the region is probably is going to happen and probably this is going to be the more likely trend. So in a sense, the NATO is still a very important element of Turkish counterbalancing towards Russia. But in dealing, in operating in the Black Sea, the Turkey doesn't put its NATO hat on. Turkey puts its Turkey hat on, but still, you know, rely on its NATO hat as necessary. And to some extent, actually, when I look at the idea of counterbalancing, historically, not only in contemporary politics, I mean, when you look at the 1856, the Crimean War of 1856 to 1952, Turkish membership in NATO, you see a very similar dynamics. 
a revisionist a threat in Russia induces uh, uh, counterbalancing strategies from the Turkey or Ottoman Empire back then. And the counterbalancing strategy usually means like, you know, bringing the counterbalancing Western actors on board to stop or to prevent the Russian threat. In 1856, that was, that meant Britain, France, I think it was Sardinia as well. Maybe many of you forget about it. But yeah, Sardinia. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sardinia, uh, France, uh, Britain, Sardinia, and uh, what else? Uh, ah, yeah, this is the three, <laughs> uh, the three countries. That's, <laughs> that's more than enough. It was these uh, three countries uh, that was in 1952, that was Turkish membership in NATO and the US counterbalancing. So the counterbalancing logic towards Russia is actually one of the constant, uh, uh, constant, uh, a constant feature of the Turkish foreign policy, particularly when the Russia becomes revisionist and Russia becomes threatening. Right now, the bad news for Turkey, Russia is revenge, revisionist. The good, good news for Turkey, Russia is reduced. So it's not the Russian Empire, it's not the Soviet Union. So therefore, this is like, I think it's uh, quite uh, an uh, important element and that's very much uh, defines the mood in Ankara. And I think here also, we have to make a distinction between the, the nexus between Turkey-Ukraine and Turkey-Russia relationship. Present Turkish-Russian relationship, though it has a very high level engagement, also very much supported by the personal rapport between Putin and Erdogan, though there's like you know, many elements that create long, long lasting dependency in this relationship, such as like, you know, the geopolitical engagement in the conflict zones through Syria, Libya, Nagorno-Karabakh, Turkey purchasing S-400, the, the nuclear power plant, et cetera. But this is not a strategic relationship. At the end of the day, the Russia knows that Turkey is a NATO member. And at the end of the day, the Turkey knows that, you know, the, the historical trends of turkish russian relationship has always been competitive, if not adversarial. But the Turkish-Ukraine relationship, I would define it as strategic. So this is not high level, this is more strategic. Uh, I know that there is that more kind of journalistically focus on the, uh, on the drone sales, but the Turkish-Ukraine the Turkish -Ukraine defense industry cooperation is much more than. The Ukraine is a know-how, uh, maybe not superpower, but great power, I would say, in defense industry. It inherited the know-how uh, and then the military infrastructure from the Soviet Union, defense industry infrastructure from the Soviet Union. And Turkey has an expanding defense industry. And I see the natural compatibility of the geopolitical aims and the natural compatibility in defense industry. And this cooperation dynamics started early on. And I think this will go on. One thing that probably we should entertain in the future, how can we have a dialogue between Turkey, Ukraine, either NATO or US and UK on defense industry to create more interoperability in this one. And the final point maybe uh, is, as Ivan also uh, uh, emphasized, the, black, the Mediterranean and, uh, and Middle East is crucial when we try to understand the dynamics of Turkish-Russian engagement in the Black Sea. Because in uh, in their relationship, these are uh, they see this like in a quite uh, integrated uh, uh, integrated uh, model, and the Russia created its Mediterranean squadron, I think in 2013 or 14, if I'm not 13, if I'm not mistaken, and Putin has succeeded uh, in in a place where Russian Empire and Soviet Union failed. That is creating a very significant presence, presence in Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. In Syria, in Libya, in Eastern Mediterranean, close defense industrial relationship and cooperation with Algeria, Egypt, etc. So in this regard, this is a success uh, story of the recent times of the Russia. But the Turkey is the one that creates interconnection. The expectation was uh, once Turkey closes straight, that will create pressure on the Russian presence in Eastern Mediterranean and Mediterranean because the Russia will not have this easy going uh, back and forth between these two spaces. The good things that was, the things that work in Russian favor, this process coincided with a process of de-escalation in the region. So this, uh, the, uh, the Ukraine invasion took place at a time when the, there was de-escalation in the region uh, in complex zones, 
And that means that reduced the pressure on the uh, Russian presence in this region, even though Russia had to reduce to some extent its presence in these conflict zones. And going forward, this will be always a factor when Turkey makes the policy towards uh, the Black Sea. Great, thank you. Uh, while people are thinking about the questions, I have a quick one to get us started. Um, so Maria, I think it was you who mentioned the, the, the management of the streets. Mm -hmm. So um, under what circumstances uh, do you think um, there might be pressure from Russia to you know, for, for reopening the straits and um, Galip, maybe under what conditions would Turkey reopen them? If the war finishes. <laughs> <laughs> so would that be a peace deal or ceasefire? Or? I think that's a challenge because define how the war finishes because one side might say that it finished, the other side might say that it didn't finish, the Russia says it's finished, the Ukraine says I'm under occupation. So therefore I think this will be uh, up for interpretation, but I don't see this opening anytime soon, inshallah. Yeah, and on, on my part, that's why I also was talking about the unclarity in the Black Sea. The question is about the Russian pressure to review the current status quo. Actually, this is a very unique situation that the application of the Montreal Convention is in Turkey's interest, in Russia's interest, in Ukraine's interest, and partly in Russia's interests. And why? Let me explain. But of course, Russia, as I said, prevented from reinforcing its naval positions in the Black Sea, but it knows that the West cannot come into the Black Sea either, not eager and cannot, is not able. So that means that this sort of, you know, parity, so it cannot, of course, as I described, it cannot carry out its initial strategic objectives for this, for this theater of, of war, but at the same time, once the Western West has left, many authoritative voices, by the way, say that we, the collective West, should have never left in December 2021, one before the reinvasion. But once the West has left, so the situation basically now is in Russia's interest. That's why I'm saying this is a quite unique situation. Yeah. And I agree with Galip. We don't know, actually, when that will be the defining moment when Turkey, this should be all coordinated and consulted with Turkey and its uh, and other United nations, of course. Uh, when when that moment will come, that the war is over. Mm -hmm. We don't have clarity on either of those questions. Yeah, just to add, I think it is very interesting that uh, particularly in the beginning, Russia was very happy with Turkey and uh, its application, very strict application of the Montreal Convention. But as its fleet gets hammered mm -hmm. increasingly, yeah. I think... Uh, we have to expect uh, a, a reassessment of the situation from Russia and a growing um, pressure to change these rules. Because, I mean, Russia lost Moskva. It has two other uh, ships, warships of the same class, one in the Baltic, one in its Pacific. It has no way of moving them. And if it comes increasingly under pressure and Ukraine continues its uh, successful campaign, which it plans to do, and especially if it gets reinforced with uh, long range missiles, um, I, I think uh, Russia will be pushing yeah. increasingly yeah. On, on this. Yeah. Uh, can I make one point? And this is, there is one relationship that of course for Turkey is going to be critically important. And this is a much closer strategic cooperation between Russia and Iran. Yeah. And this is basically everywhere. <laughs> and in a certain way, probably this is one of the most important outcome of these first two years. Uh, Russia-China relations have been there. They are much more careful, moderate because of the Chinese story. Uh, but uh, also Caspian Sea now looks totally different as a result of the Russian-Iranian cooperation. So from this point of view, and I'm sure that the colleagues will know more about this, but because you have two war theaters in the Middle East and in Ukraine. And for Turkey, obviously, the Middle East is strategically more important, also much more important from the point of view of the public opinion and so on. So for Russia, there, everybody would try to increase their leverage. So everybody is fighting for asymmetrical interdependence. Russia wants Turkey to be more dependent on them, and Turkey wants Russia to be much more dependent on them. Yeah. Okay, um, Craig. Yeah, Craig Oliver at uh, Foreign Policy Center. And first of all, thank you to all of the, the panel. Fascinating. I've got two very brief comments and a couple of questions, if I may. Um, 
first of all, really with the comments, just to really underscore, I think, the importance of what Ivan said um, about the crucial issue of Odessa mm -hmm. and that there should be no further inroads there really for everything that that can lead to. And so really just uh, underscoring that point. I thought also uh, Gallup's point about um, uh, uh, you know, the, the proposition of, yes, UK um, and uh, Turkish and Ukrainian uh, cooperation and inter interoperability, I think uh, is a really important point and needs to actually uh, be put in bold. I suppose there are two questions. First of all, to Natalie, because uh, you were talking about the interrelationships around the region. And I just wondered if you could say anything, you know, it's an open secret that I think um, President Zelensky is planning a, a visit um, to the South Caucasus um, in um, uh, coming days or a uh, week. And um, I, I just wondered if you could say a bit in terms of, uh, do you expect that to be just to Yerevan and Baku, or do you think Tbilisi is likely to feature? But your, your, your assessment of that, I think would just be useful in elaborated comments. And to Marina, um, uh, you, you've answered the Montreux um, uh, uh, Convention question. So if I might just ask you about the issue of the Kerch um, bridge mm -hmm. and what capabilities you think Ukraine has to further mm -hmm. mess up Putin's days as we, we look ahead. Thank you, Craig. And for We'll bundle a few more questions together. So the lady in red behind me. Um, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Our authority, uh, energy journalist. Uh, I have two questions. One is on uh, the security of Romania, uh, because there are a couple of points that um, were briefly touched on, but I think we need to, to go a bit deeper. Uh, if Odessa falls, uh, Romania has a treaty of good neighborliness with uh, Ukraine. Um, and of course, we know that Russia isn't a signatory to the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, neither is Turkey. That means that we'll have a tremendous um, uh, fall, fallout on uh, the relationship between Russia and, and Romania, of course, and also on the fact that Romania has gas exploration in the Black Sea. So the implications could be quite wide reaching. Uh, on the other hand, if Transnistria uh, is annexed by Russia, uh, that has implications on Moldova, as was mentioned. Uh, but Romania also may have commitments to Moldova. Many Moldovans have Romanian citizenship. And thirdly, we now see that Romania is approaching elections and a uh, populist uh, party with Kremlin ties is uh, rising in the, uh, in the polls. Uh, so I would like to hear your thoughts on the implications of security for Romania. And the second question I had was regarding the uh, coordination of the, the integration of the region. Again, it was mentioned uh, by every speaker, but I would like to understand along what lines could you see this convergence? Because we see there are different degrees of perception in security. Um, on the other hand, if energy was to be one of the convergence points, I would say that Turkey has very good relations with Russia in that respect. Uh, that cable that was mentioned by Ambassador Sabanadze, I'm not quite sure about that because it goes through Abkhazia. And uh, I'm not sure if if that is one of the points of convergence. So I'd like to know along what lines could you see that integration? Great, that's quite a lot. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, let's make a start on those. Maybe Natalie, let's let's start with you. There's also a question online on whether you have seen Georgia's uh, approaches to the Black Sea change since the start of the war. In addition to the question about uh, President Zelensky's visit. Uh, yeah, thank you. Briefly, um, I think the war has shown a very interesting kind of shift in geopolitical shift in the South Caucasus. And the war and the attitudes towards the war is almost like a litmus test that demonstrates these shifts. Armenia started out as supporting Russia, basically. Um, and after the collapse of Nagorno-Karabakh and Russia, uh, 
uh, aiding Azerbaijan, we can say, um, the position of Armenia changed. Uh, and one of the first things that Armenia did to signal this change was to reach out to Ukraine and uh, reach out to the European Union and sort of uh, start shifting uh, westwards. And I think this visit is a recognition of this from uh, President Zelensky and also a sign of support that out of the three countries before it was always Georgia that was kind of uh, the most pro-Western and its pro-Western orientation could have been taken for granted, which is no more the case, no longer the case. So Armenia is trying to emerge and almost take that position. And, um, uh, and Ukraine obviously supports that. Azerbaijan, uh, almost like Turkey in many ways, have managed to, um, to navigate this difficult um, situation quite skillfully. Uh, again, using uh, to its advantage good relations with Russia, but also maintaining good relations with Ukraine, supporting openly or not openly. So uh, President Zelensky has repeatedly sort of uh, voiced uh, gratitude to Azerbaijan. And if there is a visit, I think that would confirm this, which leaves Georgia out. Um, and I think it would be a very striking uh, sign of the shifting kind of dynamic and political priorities in Georgia, growing uh, influence of Russia. Georgia has been going through the kind of clear rapprochement with Russia. It justifies this out of fear for the conflict to spill over and describes it as a pragmatic policy. But there can be no... Um, there can be no guarantees with Russia, no matter how pragmatic you are. The opening of the bases in Ochamchira does exactly what the government tries to prevent, which is dragging Georgia <coughs> out of the conflict. Um, but there is more to it. I think Georgia, it fits now into this uh, zone of um, uh, states that are increasingly ideologically and geopolitically under Russia's influence, ideologically also in terms of kind of pushing back on the idea of liberal democracy, increasingly liberal, increasingly this sort of hybrid regimes that form almost like a belt around Russia. And one of the um, one of the threats actually to the EU and NATO is precisely Russia using Black Sea to spread its influence through Western Balkans, Georgia including as part of this group through using uh, uh, penetration, information penetration in, in, in Bulgaria, Austria, Serbia, Bosnia, um, and is doing it quite successfully in uh, Georgia as well. So what Georgia does uh, in response is sort of multi-vectoring its foreign policy, which is completely new. Uh, it's a signed strategic uh, cooperation agreement with China. It's very interesting now the decision will have to be made on the investor uh, in the port of Anaklia. And there are two consortiums competing, one European, one Chinese, Singaporean. There are rumors that uh, it will go to the Chinese. Um, one justification could be precisely because of Russia's threat that if it is a Chinese investment, Russians won't attack it and won't destabilize it quite to the same extent. So there's a lot of um, uh, a lot going on there. And uh, yeah, on Romania, uh, I agree completely. I think Romania is very vulnerable. It is vulnerable through Moldova. Uh, uh, if Odessa falls, obviously uh, Transnistria is basically totally uh, exposed. Transnistria is busy now urging Russia to assist, uh, to avoid pressure because Moldovan government is trying to use the situation to put pressure um, on Transnistria to integrate it uh, more economically. Um, Moldova, which uh, Transnistria is uh, resisting, uh, it's a weak link. So, um, uh, there is also an interesting moment that uh, in the Odessa region, uh, there are Romanian speaking minorities. So this will be an additional leverage in the hands of Russia if they fall under Russia's jurisdiction to destabilize not only Moldova, but also uh, Romania. So I actually agree with Ivan that even though all the attention now is on the Baltics and, and, and Poland, this area is... Uh, perhaps more vulnerable, uh, particularly if uh, there is a success on that front. Thank you. 
Marina. Yes. Yes. So uh, let me ask, let me answer the question about the carriage bridge and which, which capabilities Ukraine need to amass or still lacking uh, to, to, to hit the carriage bridge. Basically, the carriage bridge was built by Russia in 2018 to connect the Russian mainland and the occupied Crimea. And we understand that from a military point of view, it's crucial because it provides the supply lines and logistics for, our, for Russian forces in Crimea. Uh, military planners, uh, experts famously call this whole campaign as a tale of two bridges, which is one carriage bridge and one is land bridge, which Russia created uh, by occupying additional territories of Ukraine uh, in 2022, so co connecting occupied Donbas, Crimea, with this land bridge. So basically, for Ukrainians to to uh, to be successful, you need to address both. And to, uh, there, there were attempts. You, you might be aware already to hit the carriage uh, carriage, uh, carriage straight bridge. Uh, temporarily, it was uh, suspended, but then reopened again. So and uh, here, yes, uh, the question of capabilities is extremely crucial, crucial one, because uh, Ukraine managed to be successful in, I don't know, sinking Moskva uh, flagship by its own Neptunes, or then later attacking with, uh, with British uh, uh, storm shadows, the Russian Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Sevastopol. But again, for the Kerch Strait Bridge, as I'm told, what a military expert here, which I'm told you need capabilities which Ukraine still doesn't have. Uh, longer range artillery, the attack mass are seen not to be still delivered. Uh, they are likely to be committed to Ukraine very soon by the US. We see the Congress still not approving. So you need those capabilities to, 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 to do that, those. And uh, yes, uh, just uh, as, as a final thought, probably, uh, we, we've all heard and it made really shockwaves the, uh, the article written by the already ex-commander uh, of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, Valery Zaluzhny, for the government. And he wrote that Ukraine is losing this war. So this was, you remember, my, you might remember, this was uh, widely reported everywhere. There was a second part of the message there, which was, I would say, not so noticed. And the second part he mentioned, Ukraine is losing this war, or will lose this war, unless... And this unless is very important, unless provided those capabilities. So uh, he, he, uh, Ukrainian, I mean, if you ask Ukrainian armed forces, I mean, the, and the policymakers, they would be all united, you know, behind the idea that those capabilities are crucial. And still, that tide can be achieved in the war. There are no capabilities in place. Promised capabilities are no capabilities, as we understand. Non-delivered capabilities are still not making change on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe on the question uh, of integration, um, maybe I'll just add, add on to that. We hear a lot about how Russia sees the, you know, the uh, Middle East and the Black Sea region as integrated, how Russia has the big picture, and, with, um, and uh, others seemingly, they all, you know, um, they just wear their own hats. They don't want to <laughs> wear other hats. So, um, yeah, what are the perspectives of maybe changing that? And what kind of an event would, would change that? Yeah, start. Not only connectivity, but maybe you know, more integrated action. Okay. Well, I think let me link this question to, uh, there was also a question of connectivity, uh, to, to two of them. One of them, uh, I mean, there has been different discussion of how there could be more integration or you know, connection between the other Black Sea countries. Uh, because when we discuss, when we talk about the EU member or the EU candidate states, that effectively means everyone but Russia. And when we say the economic integration between EU member and EU candidate countries in the Black Sea, that more or less means everything, everyone but uh, but but Russia. I think, like for instance, this middle corridor, uh, just an idea, but that also comes with a dilemma, because that also yes, uh, that might. Uh, that might function in a way to circumvent Russia, but it also comes with China. As Natalia rightly put, uh, rightly put it, the China's presence in these regions is growing. So the question is, uh, is this region part of a broader great power competition in which the Russia is immediate threat and then China is long-term threat, therefore like you know, 
the a reduction in the foothold uh, footprint of Russia should not be filled by uh, China, or is it right now the priority is Russia and therefore, like you know, for the time being, the Chinese footprint is not as threatening or as bad as uh, many many things. So that's uh, uh, that's the uh, that's uh, one dilemma I think that uh, everyone has. But uh, otherwise, uh, I agree. Right now, the energy cooperation is not unlikely to circumvent uh, uh, Russia because the Turkey is not going to reduce dependency on Russia in any significant manner. To the contrary, I think the more Russia is squeezed, the more countries like Turkey or India or many other countries will benefit from the Russian uh, Russia being squeezed. You see this from the level of jump in the Indian energy trade uh, with Russia, and I think the same. The same is the case with uh, Turkey as well. I mean, regarding uh, regarding the like why Russia treat these regions as integrated, but the West doesn't, right? I think. I mean, one of them, the difference. Uh, I mean, when we say West, effectively, there we mean U.S. or we mean EU, because this is the EU neighborhood. But unfortunately, it's the U.S. that matters in uh, in in security <laughs> in security matters. Well, Russia has a unified security culture, and therefore that you know that uh, links them together. But in the EU countries, for instance, like let me just give you an example of Libya. Uh, there was several NATO member countries there at loggerhead. Uh, over the Libya. So the Turkey was there, France was there, Libya was there. But for instance, effectively, France and Russia was on the same side. Uh, I think from the problem from the French perspective, an increase in the foothold of <clears throat> Turkey was much more inimical than an increase in the foothold of, foothold of Russia. And you see this also more or less in uh, in in Africa as well. So uh, like whereas the you know the reverse was the case with Italian. So there, I think with the EU, the obvious case that we have with the EU, the EU not being able to have operation as a security culture that also will have geopolitical uh, implication. And the trouble that at the time when the US was downsizing its security commitments in these uh, regions, the Western actors didn't feel it. Like in Syria, the reduction in the US footprint meant actually an increase in the Russian footprint. In Libya, the U.S. more or less wanted the European countries to lead it in one way or another, and the result is, you know, uh, the result is there, uh, there to see. So unless and until the, we see either the U.S. committing to it or the European committing to security and geopolitics, I don't think that this is going to uh, have any turn. But the, the final point that uh, I think is very crucial, uh, to some extent, again, I will bring U.K. into the picture as well, at a time when there are like so many questions and uncertainty over the over uh, over the uh, U.S., particularly if Trump comes to the power, uh, I see it's crucial to have the European security debates regarding the neighborhood that includes UK, your EU member states, Turkey, but I think like particularly for the Eastern one, Ukraine as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, I have quite a few questions on the list, so I'm going to ask for one question next one <laughs> for, for um, the person. So, Sarah, let's start with you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Sarah Pilanch, Kaderas University. I'm going to ask two questions to two speakers, then I will uh, ask a question to Ivan. Uh, I kind of sense uh, a tension between two of your statements. One is that uh, Turkey is the most important strategic player uh, in Europe's periphery, and Russia cannot afford to lose Turkey, which I agree. Then uh, you kind of expressed uh, your anticipation that Russia may engage in an act of provocation in the Black Sea. But uh, from my understanding, uh, if such a provocation occurs, especially on Romania and Bulgaria, then Turkey may be compelled to reconsider its position and its ties with, with Russia. I mean, because in that, in that case, Turkey will have to take a clear sum in case of a uh, clear-cut uh, provocation on a NATO member state. Uh, am I wrong in my conclusion or my prediction? 
Thank you. Let's park that thought for and collect a few more questions. Um, so, gentlemen over there, please. Uh, thank you, Lubika. My name is Özgür Ünlü Sarcıklı. I'm the Ankara Office Director of the German Marshall Fund. May I make a one sentence comment? One, one sentence, sentence only. Yeah. It will be a long <laughs> sentence. <though. laughs> uh, so, let me see if I can make it one sentence. But anyway, so according to uh, my knowledge, uh, Turkey blocked the Bosnians based on the Montreal Convention after Kiev shared military intelligence with Ankara, and the intelligence may have come from another intelligence agency, that Russia was preparing uh, to bring ships from the Syrian theater into the Black Sea as part of a plan uh, to put naval pressure on Odessa, uh, suggesting that even in, in the beginning, uh, so Ankara's decision uh, to block the, both the straits was actually as, as part of an effort to support Ukraine, even if it didn't. So that was uh, my comment, but Marina uh, may know uh, more about the subject. My question to Galip is, Galip, you talked about, and you do this all the time, by the way, I you know, <laughs> read from you what Russia represents for Turkey. Uh, but I mean, I would like you to tell us what Ukraine uh, represents for Turkey. I mean, like, look, uh, so Turkey is acquiring engines uh, from Ukraine uh, for its Anka drones, Bayraktar drones, Kızılayma drones. And Sarah just informed me uh, that Ukraine is actually part of Turkey's fighter jet uh, program as well. But is there more to it? So why is Ukraine important for Turkey? Great. Thank you, Oscar. Dimitar, you have a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dimitar Bechev, Kari Europe, for a great panel. Turkey actually um, has been very opportunistic because let's not mm -hmm. forget it's the third largest import of Russian crude oil right now. Mm -hmm. And it will become even more important because Bulgaria, which was number four until recently because of oil, mm -hmm. is uh, turning off the tap. So Turkey, look at Sokar and, and mm -hmm. Alia and the type of contracts they have for crude oil. So that's an element. Mm -hmm. And then that's why right now Russia needs more Turkey than vice versa. Russia needs more Iran than Iran used to. Um, and so on and so forth. My question is about NATO. When we talk NATO, we look at the naval component. But there is the land-based component and also uh, air policing, especially in all the Romania and Bulgarian so any comments about the military balance apart from this perspective? And, and by the way, I don't believe Romania is vulnerable. I mean, look at their military spending capabilities, yeah. F-35 uh, being in the pipeline. And finally, Ukraine, there is the contract which has been fulfilled to deliver a Corvette, the Mazepa, which is now in Mykolaiv. So what's the story there? Because it hasn't been commissioned. The Turks gave it to Ukraine, but it hasn't been put in service. So any update will be uh, welcome. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I'll try to get a couple more. So the lady up to me. Uh, my name is Gökso and I'm an undergraduate student at UCLC, so I'm the anomaly here. Um, my question is for Ambassador Sabinadze. Um, given what President Zurebishvili said yesterday about her fears on um, Russian influence on the upcoming elections in October and her thoughts on Ukraine and Georgia needing to get closer to the EU, um, how can Georgia be incorporated in a broader Black Sea security strategy? And would you consider this as a call for help? Thank you. Okay, that's quite a lot to get on with. So Ivan, maybe let's start with you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'll try to be brief. You are absolutely right that there are contradictions and tensions, but don't forget in the Russia-Turkish relations, we have contradictions and tensions all the time. <laughs> uh, so from this point of view, when we're talking about provocation, we're not basically imagining Russia attacking directly uh, the country, but destroying a radar system, false flag operation, just trying to show, because where is the real advantage of Russia in places like Bulgaria and Romania is that you don't know exactly what is going to be the reaction of these countries. Are they going to ask for a much more NATO presence, troops and so on, or they try to basically ask for de-escalating and try right keeping down and so on, which we know how the Baltics are going to react. Uh, and from this point of view, uh, also, in my view, there is this important asymmetry because Turkey has a variety of interests. And if uh, Turkey basically has learned very well, is that obviously it has more than two heads. It's not simply NATO and not NATO. <laughs> basically, they're creating a different head uh, for every different crisis that they go. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, but I'm saying this in a much more positive connotation. So in a certain way, Turkey is not going to be eager 
you basically get an unchanged identity if we're talking about a kind of a moderate level of provocation. Because I could be wrong, and here I'm very much interested, the other colleagues, I had the feeling that for Turkey, keeping the room for maneuvering in this situation is one of the major objectives. This is basically where they very much act as a middle power and not simply as a NATO member. No much love lost with respect to Russia. I very much agree. I don't see this. Uh, and, and here comes the story of domestic politics, because we are in a year in which there is wars, but there is also too much elections. Uh, Russia is going to interfere. Honestly speaking, in the case of Georgia, I will be surprised if the Ukrainians will not try also to do something. Because to such an extent, uh, what is happening now in the region very much depends on the election results, on political parties, on processes. So we're going to see also intensification of this kind of a soft power attempt, trying to mobilize your own, trying basically to play uh, different cards in order to change the dynamics. And from this point of view, the Balkan uh, three countries, they have a classical characteristics of uh, of being a periphery. And while the military capabilities of Romania, in my view, I very much agree with Dimo, are very capable, the political consensus on the level of the elite probably is. But the readiness to basically be engaged in a major conflict is very different than what you're seeing on the Baltic side. On elections, uh, well, Georgia is one more country that's going to have elections this year. Um, these are uh, important because they will be first time fully proportional elections and the ruling party will be contesting fourth uh, consecutive victory. So both fully proportionality and fourth time staying in power um, should detrimentally affect its chances of getting um, full government forming majority. So these elections will be watched carefully and they will be also looking for potential coalition partners that will be convenient. And in this context, we see uh, a growing um, number of kind of pro-Russian, non-Western, let's put it, uh, political groupings. There was one new party that was just established, uh, which has direct, allegedly direct funding from uh, Moscow. Uh, it is in uh, Moscow's interest to keep the current uh, government in power. It uh, does not shy away from praising them. Um, as we know. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the impact will be there. Uh, and I think uh, that there should be also a response from the West uh, in terms of election observation, which should be different from the traditional one, because I think traditional or dear style election observation is pretty much outdated now. It's much more long term and nobody steals elections on the day of election. It's done way before. So the process, is already starting with the uh, emergence of this kind of political parties, with the consolidation by a ruling party of all institutions, et cetera, et cetera. And these should be red flags that in principle, uh, people should already be paying uh, attention to. So um, uh, President Zorobishvili will be here in a couple hours. You can ask her directly. <laughs> but um, uh, but I, I agree that this is important. Georgia can be nevertheless or should be. And again, the outcome of election and who's in power will depend much. Uh, be included in the Black Sea strategy. I mean, one of the things that Dima also asked about NATO, NATO never had a Black Sea strategy, neither EU. So now everybody's sort of busy drafting various strategies. Um, and I think uh, this should also include the uh, perception and the importance of the Black Sea in its connection to the other yeah. regions, uh, and particularly in this uh, contested geopolitical uh, uh, framework. Georgia uh, should be offered as well, um, whatever will be on the table to include Georgia, including building some of its non-existent <coughs> naval capabilities. Um, Georgia-Ukrainian cooperation, if it was to take place, could be very important. Uh, again, I mentioned that Ukraine will be critical uh, pillar of the Western containment policy uh, in the Black Sea towards Russia. Georgia, Ukraine together would be uh, even stronger. Pillar. And that's something that 
uh, we need to work on. But at the moment, there is no, there, I don't really see a strategy to achieve this result. Um, and I feel that despite the candidate status, despite um, tools that uh, EU and NATO have to influence uh, uh, processes in Georgia, they have kind of stepped back. Uh, and the result might be um, advantageous to Russia. Uh, so that's um, my take. <clears throat> yes, I would like to add also on the question probably about uh, the NATO's. Uh, when I mentioned about naval component missing, I think, yes, I, I should have added that there are other components, of course, strengthened in NATO's defense and, uh, and uh, deterrence posture in the Black Sea. So if, if we receive the upgrade, you see the creation of new multinational battle groups. So they upgrade to the brigade level, around 4,000 troops. We see Turkey contributing to all this with air police mission. Of course, that's all it needs to, uh, to be mentioned here uh, as a part of this you know, uh, um, response uh, to Russia's actions. And uh, yes, uh, so now we have, I think, an important achievement before uh, the enhanced forward presence in Baltics and tailored forward presence in, in Black Sea were disintegrated, where they were not connected. Now we have them connected, basically. We have one single you know, uh, response here. So this is uh, uh, very, very, very important. But that brings me again to my point again. If our commitment is to have, uh, I think the wording is, permanent rotational naval presence in the Black Sea. So this at least what you know, the draft of the US Black Sea strategy I, I've read, or many say about the need of 365 days per year naval presence, rotational naval presence in the Black Sea. I think I just wanted to say that we need to start thinking how do we achieve this in current conditions, this objective. Uh, I mean, with all, with all with all the situation, you asked about uh, about the corvettes. The Turkey is uh, building for for Ukraine two other class corvettes. I know, to the best of my knowledge, one is ready. I mean, one was commissioned already, but uh, I don't know. In, no, it's not in the public domain. At least I haven't seen why why they're not presumably because it, they would fall an easy target. You know, yeah, uh, for, 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 for the for the for the Russian forces, there should be some intergovernmental uh, understanding between Ukraine and Turkey or on this very, and I think uh, I've seen the Turkish comment, uh, comments also, Sirhat and others experts who know the topic well commenting that uh, Turkey and uh, Ukraine, uh, they have this uh, really flourishing defense cooperation because Ukraine is more let's say generous in terms of how they offer their technologies as compared to other el Turkey's allies who we know Turkey is under sanctions, so this defense uh, technologies transfer is occurring without impediments and freer and let's say benefiting both parties and uh, both parties a lot. We've seen joint ventures created in Ukraine, including. So I think this is a very promising value for cooperation between the two countries. I think there was a sort of question. One of them about uh, you know basically Turkey having multiple uh, uh, multiple heads. And I think this is like uh, the trend that we see in the contemporary international affairs. Uh, so, uh, and, I, and I used to argue, well, as the peoples start to more and more in modern time have hyphenated identities, I think we're going to see the states also more and more having hyphenated geopolitical identities. Particularly, this is going to be the case for the uh, multi-regional states. We will see the, uh, uh, we will see a trend in which they will have hyphenated, hyphenated geopolitical identities more and more. And this is like, you know, you, you see the case with Turkey, this is the case you see with uh, with uh, India. I think we'll see with many more states going forward. So hyphenated geopolitical identity for state. Secondly, the question of dependency, who needs who more? Uh, this is was never, uh, the, the question of dependency, interdependency or symmetry, asymmetry, in Russia's relationship with Turkey, with Iran, other regional countries, this is not a static picture. It's a dynamic process and it's been redefined by each and every single crisis. If you ask this question to me, let's say like six, seven years ago, I would say that you know, the Russia has the upper hand. 
if you, now I think the, it is the Russia relatively losing this upper hand in its relation with almost all regional uh, actors because the more that Russia is squeezed in other battlefields, the more that Russia will need this uh, this type of relationship with regional countries. So this question of uh, dependency or interdependency in Russia-Turkey relationship is dynamically changing and uh, and uh, and increasingly the Russians needs for this increase and therefore despite all the pressure or friction uh, that are emerging in the relationship i think the the both sides will do their best to make sure that this relationship still remains on track i mean the lavrov is coming i think i just uh, read the news that lavrov is coming to turkey probably for the antalya diplomacy forum for this weekend that will take place in antalya so uh, this type of engagement uh, will uh, will be there uh, özgür on your question about you know we have we know what Russia represents for Turkey, but what Ukraine represents for Turkey. I mean, obviously there is a difference uh, because Russia, Turkey, Iran uh, are the long lasting states in the Euro-Asian landscape. And therefore they have established entrenched perception towards each other, both at societal and political level. And this is not the case. Is this not the case uh, in Turkish-Ukraine relationship? So there is very well established perception about Russia, both at settled and political level, uh, and I would say largely negative, uh, despite the rising anti-Western discontent of the recent years might have reduced it. But uh, even both in the political Islamic or the nationalist discourse in Turkey, the Russia was depicted largely as much more unfavorable than even the West, because the Ottoman Sultan at the end of the day saw itself as part of the European imperial order. The Khilafat was not the overarching uh, framework of this polity, rather than it was the empire, and this empire was part of the European imperial order. But with Ukraine, it is a work in progress and process, but I think you see the certain themes emerging in the policy perception. One of them is definitely Ukraine is one of the key uh, actor or element of Turkish imagination of counterbalancing Russia in the Black Sea. Uh, despite all the, you know, all this lovely story that is being exchanged, the pleasantries that is being exchanged at the leadership level, at the end of the day, this relationship is inherently competitive, if not adversarial at the end of the day. So one of them is Ukraine as natural ally as, you know, more compatible in geopolitical, in defense industry, in other terms. The secondly, the idea of defense industry, defense industry is really gaining very central position in this relationship. Uh, the Ukraine was only second to Qatar uh, in purchasing uh, from the Bayraktar TBU2 drones. And, it, and this was not under Zelensky, it was under the previous uh, uh, leadership. And this is not a trade relationship. This is really a relationship that is uh, involved like inter, uh, you know, joint, uh, joint production, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final one, I would say, uh, there is a difference between the post-imperial and post-colonial states, I would say, uh, towards the war in Ukraine. And this, I know this might be controversial. I think the post-imperial society tend to sympathize more with Ukraine. Whereas the post-colonial states, particularly the one that was colonized by the Western actors, tend to have more understanding towards Russia because then it's their discontent with the West that define their approach to Russia. Thanks, David. Uh, we're a little bit over time, so I'm very sorry we didn't get around to all the questions. So uh, those of you whose questions we didn't get around to answering, uh, your best chance is to catch our speakers after the event, maybe as you wait for President Zerbeshvili. Um, um, so yeah, just to close the discussion, um, thank you very much everyone for joining the event, in person or online. Thank you very much to Julia for partnering with Chatham House on this discussion. And yeah, please join me in thanking our panelists.